Today we are privileged to hear from Pastor Dave Largent. Uh, Dave was reared on his family farm in central Illinois and made a pro profession of faith in his childhood. After high school, he moved to Chicago where he earned a Bachelor of Science in Electronic Engineering Technology, met and married his wife Cindy, and began his career in the com computer industry with Motorola. In 1991, Dave and Cindy moved to Arizona for job advancement in Motorola. In Phoenix, they led discipleship studies, which resulted in ministry opportunities that ultimately led them to come to DTS. Dave and Cindy have been married for 34 years. They have two sons, Samuel and Stephen, and both Samuel and Stephen are here today. Would you guys stand? Would you mind? Let us just recognize you for being here. Samuel is 24 and Stephen is 19. Uh, thanks for being here today, guys. Um, Dave, you know him as the senior systems analyst in IT. Uh, most likely he's been around to help you. He's helped me numerous times, probably a bazillion. <laughs> but, uh, but Dave is also the pastor of Lakeview Congregation at Autumn Leaves. And uh, it's a ministry that I think a lot of our students ought to consider. Uh, Dave has a pastor's heart. He's told me many, many stories of the people there that he loves dearly. Dave roasts his own coffee beans, loves to cook, hike, read, and of course, to spend time with people. So will you join me in welcoming Dave Largent to our chapel today? Thank you, Pastor Joe, and thank you all for this uh, amazing opportunity. As a pastor of a church at a retirement center, uh, I preached nearly every week for over five years, and uh, all of a sudden in March, that came to a complete halt. So uh, this, uh, this feels really good to stand behind a, a podium again and the opportunity to share God's word, and I am so excited to be here with you all today. I have some good news for you all today, and I have some not so good news, all right? The good news is I have a five-word message for you, a simple, clear, direct five-word message for you. The bad news is that everybody here who knows me knows that I can't say hello in less than five words. <laughs> and I've got a few other things to say about this five-word message. But this five-word message is Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And you probably recognize this as being from one of Paul's letters. In fact, it's from 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And the first five verses of that chapter is going to be our primary text this morning. But as you're sitting there, you may be thinking, well, Dave... You know, we know this. We've, we've known that Jesus is the Christ. We know that he died on the cross. We've believed this. We've even signed a doctrinal statement when we came to DTS uh, agreeing that we believe this. Uh, don't you think this is a bit elementary for a seminary chapel? And, you know, I, could, I can uh, appreciate that sentiment. I think I had that similar kind of response when this, uh, the, this passage first came to my Mind made an impression upon me, rather, in my seminary time. And uh, I'll give you a little bit of background before we read the text. Uh, you know, I'm a person who needs simple, clear, and direct messages. Uh, when, when I came here in 1997, Cindy and I, uh, Sam was just turning a year old, so we had a, a young child. Uh, and within the span of a week, we moved to Texas I received a job opportunity and began the job here at DTS, and I began my study here. A lot of life uh, stresses there, a lot of life dynamics, and I don't need to tell most of you what it's like those first couple weeks of seminary. And uh, I was not handling it very well. In fact, I, I was so frantic those first few weeks. I said something to my wife like, I, I can't handle this. I'm going to flunk out. And my wife gave me a simple, clear, direct message. She said, God didn't bring us here for you to flunk out. Shut up and study. <laughs> so, 
That's about all you need to know about my wife. <laughs> well, I, obviously I didn't fl flunk out, and, uh, but I was on the marathon plan here. It took me eight years to finish a, a degree here. And about halfway through that, I was overwhelmed again. I was tired, I was exhausted, and uh, you know, I was asking myself, what is it that I really need to get? What is it that I need to grasp a hold of for life and ministry beyond seminary? There's so much I'm learning, so many good things I'm learning here, but what is it I really need to, to get a hold of? And that's when this passage, or Paul's words, I decided to be concerned about nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I think I may have even laughed at myself saying, well, you know, I already know that. I believe that. What more can I have to learn from it? But over the years, this text has called me back to it. And I've, uh, and I've found that this text, this message, this five-word message, uh, brings focus and priority in life and ministry. I find that it brings encouragement at times. And I find that it also brings some conviction. And I'd like to, uh, we'll, we'll go ahead and read the text. I'm going to read the text. And we're going to ask two basic questions uh, of what's happening here in this text. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, he says, When I came to you, brothers and sisters, I did not come with superior eloquence or wisdom as I proclaimed the testimony of God. For I decided to be concerned about nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and with much trembling. My conversation and my preaching were not with persuasive words of wisdom, but with a demonstration of the spirit and of power so that your faith would not be based on human wisdom, but on the power of God. Now, I've got two questions. The first question is, why was this message so important that the Apostle Paul prioritized this when he went to Corinth? And the second message I'm going to ask is, so why does he need to remind them of this message? So as I look at this, the first thing I notice is when I came to you brothers. You know, Paul had been there before. And you look at this message, this five-word message, and you go, well, how long did that take? Jesus Christ and him crucified. Was this a half an hour, half a day, maybe a weekend? But as you may know, Luke tells us in Acts chapter 18 that Paul was at Corinth for 18 months. 18 months. He was a year and a half. Jesus Christ and him crucified. Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I'm thinking to myself, well, is that it? Well, you know, did he, did he talk about the resurrection? Well, yeah, he talked about the resurrection. He tells us so later in this letter that uh, he's reminding them and, and telling them more about the resurrection of Christ and the ultimate resurrection of our bodies. So I'm sure that there were many other discussions, but there's, a, there's obvious a priority about Jesus Christ and him crucified. What is it? As I read through these five verses, I see Paul telling us three things. I see us telling us, him telling us about the nature of this message. He gives us the content of the message. And finally, the result, the expected result of the message. What do I mean by that? Well, notice in verse 1, he says, I did not come with superior eloquence or wisdom. Paul, of all the people in the New Testament that I would want as my top speaker at a lectureship, a theological lecture, it would be the Apostle Paul. Here's a guy who could bring it. But he's saying, I left all that at home. Why? Because he says, I was proclaiming God's testimony. This message of Jesus Christ, he says, is God's testimony. It's not mankind's. This message has a, has a divine source and a divine authority. He, he echoes this again in verse 4. He says, My conversation and my preaching were not with persuasive words of wisdom, but of power, a demonstration of the Spirit and of power. And I think to myself, wow, how often do I think that I've got a divine message to give to people? 
when people say, well, why, what are you doing at seminary? And it's, it's, it's so easy to get caught up in, in telling them, you know, uh, all about me <laughs> and all about what I know and maybe uh, sharing some things that I've learned in seminary. And I forget that I've got, that God has, that I have the privilege of giving people God's testimony and not mine. I think Paul's saying I had to get out of the way so I could give them God's testimony. Well, that brings us to the, the content of the message. And I look at this first part, Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ. And I spent some time uh, reading about the, the word Christ. And I was wondering, it's like, what all did the Corinthians understand? Did they have this, uh, this uh, comprehensive Christological view that we share today? And I, I could find no evidence to, to argue that before you today. But I thought to myself, well, well, Christ, at the very basic level, Christ is anointed one. He's, this is the word from Messiah. He's saying Jesus was the Messiah. Why is that significant? It's significant because Jesus isn't just another good teacher that came along and, and gained a following. He's not just another uh, um, uh, person who did some amazing things and gained popularity. Uh, I just finished recently a biography on the life of Benjamin Franklin, and the biographer um, spoke of somebody asking Ben Franklin about his views of Jesus. And Ben Franklin uh, said, well, I think Jesus is great. He was a virtuous man. Uh, he was a virtuous man, all right, but he was so much more. He was God's Messiah. Amen. He was God's Christ. And the scriptures point to it. Jesus himself said this. Uh, after, shortly after his resurrection, resurrection uh, if you're familiar with that story of Jesus joining those disciples on that walk to Emmaus, and, and uh, he, he pretends they don't recognize him. He pretends that he doesn't know what they're talking about. And they start talking about Jesus. And we, uh, we, we even hoped, he, they said, we even hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. They were hoping that Jesus was the Messiah. But now, now all of our dreams, all of our expectations have been shattered because he's been crucified. So Jesus begins to open their eyes. Before he fully helps them see who he is. He says, you know, wasn't it necessary for the Christ to suffer these things and enter into his glory? Then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things written about himself in all the scriptures. I think that's what Paul was doing for these 18 months. He was opening the scriptures. He was saying, this Jesus I'm talking about, he's not just a, another dynamic figure. He is God's Messiah. Wow. What about the second part of the message? And him crucified. And him crucified. When I think about the cross, the passage that comes to my mind so quickly is a passage I, I providentially uh, got to write an exegetical paper on back in Romans. And um, uh, Romans 3, 21 through 26. Now, the first two and a half chapters of Romans is got Paul talking about God's wrath coming upon mankind for mankind's disobedience. It's just. It's, God's not being mean, but mankind has, has dug their heels in and rebelled against God. And he's saying God, is, God doesn't just overlook these things. He, he is a just God, and he will discipline uh, a disobedience. And then we get, in, in verse 21 of chapter 3, we get one of those magical words we learn in Bible study methods, right? That magic word, but. Right? But. Romans 3.21. But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God, although it is attested by the law and the prophets, has been disclosed or revealed. Namely, the righteousness of God through the faithfulness of Jesus Christ, for all who believe, for there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, but they are freely justified by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. God publicly displayed him at his death as the mercy seat accessible through faith. 
this was to demonstrate his righteousness because God in his forbearance had passed over the sins previously committed. This was also to demonstrate his righteousness in the present time so that he would be just and the justifier of the one who lives because of Jesus' faithfulness. Folks, Jesus died. It's not just a historical fact. Jesus died to reveal God's righteousness. Jesus died to reveal God's grace. Jesus died to reveal his mercy. And he, Jesus di died to reveal God's redemptive plan to redeem lost people, lost rebellious people to himself. Isn't that great news? What, what a, great, uh, a great message. And I think Paul was, was explaining these things. And we start, to, we start to understand, get a better picture of why he focused on this for a, a year and a half. It's the priority of, of God's message, of God's testimony. And we need to understand that, that, that God's divine this God's testimony of a divine source, divine authority is speaking of Jesus of divine origin and divine authority to share a divine purpose. And, and that brings us to this, this uh, our, our, uh, God, uh, Paul is revealing the nature of God's message He's revealing the content of it and then the purpose. We see, we see that in verse 5. So that your faith would not be based on human wisdom, but on the power of God. Yeah. Uh, what an incredible privilege. Folks, we do not need an evangelism strategy. We do not need an evangelism program. We need an evangelism obedience. We need an evangelism faith. That, that we have this divine message that God is going to do the work. God's going to do the, the hard work. And this is where I find encouragement, too. The, the encouragement and the fact that God doesn't need me. And you may say, well, that sounds kind of strange. Why is that encouraging? Well, if God's the one doing all the, the hard work, the, the power, we are just mouthpieces of this divine message, then... I realized, I asked myself, well, why is God bothering? Folks, God has given us a front row seat to watch his power at work. A front row seat. It's a blessing for us. He's not holding us culpable for the results. We get the privilege of sharing this divine message, getting out of the way and letting God do the amazing work. I think that's why Paul spent a year and a half sharing that message of Jesus Christ and him crucified with these folks at Corinth. Well, that brings us to the second question I have. So why is he reminding them of that? You know, after a year and a half of Jesus Christ and him crucified, uh, you'd think that they would get it, and, but he, he feels the need to uh, remind them of it in this letter. Is it that they had not believed it in the first place, or is it uh, that they had abandoned this message? No, that's not it. He makes it pretty clear in the first opening verses of his letter, back in chapter 1, verses 4 through 8. These are believers. He's convinced that they are believers. They have accepted the gospel of Jesus Christ. But we see the problem. We see what he's getting after, beginning in verse 10. In verse 10, verses 10 and 11, we find that these believers at Corinth are dividing. There are divisions among them, and they are quarreling. Over in chapter 3, uh, he, he speaks of them still having jealousy and dissensions. And he says they're even acting like unregenerate people. And uh, so what's going on? Well, some are saying, I am of Paul, and I am of Apollos, I am of Cephas, I am of Christ. And what do we see here? We see a fundamental issue of pride, don't we? It's a fundamental issue of pride. And um, uh, so uh, as I think about this, and as I've, I've worked through this, I think about all the, the things that we do today that are causing divisions in the church. And it grieves me. And I thought, well, I could talk about this, and I could talk about that, and I could go after this, this cause. And then I realized, 
Well, if I do that, I would just be standing up here using this opportunity to share my own wisdom, to be talking about my perspective and not sharing God's wisdom. And the point is, he's, he's not telling him back in verse um, Back in verse 10 of chapter 1, he says, he says, you need to agree together to end your divisions and to be united by the same mind and purpose. I don't think he's expecting me to convince everybody to agree with me on everything. <laughs> no, no, that's not it. He's not expecting me to, uh, uh, to assert my opinion over other people. He's saying... What is your priority? As believers in Christ, he says, is Christ divided, he asked? Or was Paul crucified for you? No, no. And over in chapter 3, he says, don't you know you're God's temple? You're God's temple. You need to be united. And so I asked myself, well, how do we do that? And another writing of Paul, another charge of Paul came to my mind as I was thinking about that. And it's over in Philippians chapter 2. It has a similar kind of message. He says, you should have the same attitude toward one another that Christ Jesus had. What was that? Who, though he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be grasped but emptied himself by taking on the form of a slave, by looking like other men, and by sharing in human nature. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross, even death on a cross. Wow. The one who was righteous, perfectly, not me, the one who is perfectly just, not me. (laughs) The one who is perfectly, um, has a perfect plan of redemption to God, that's not me. All of my thinking about anything issue, uh, uh, any issues, is just foolishness compared to God's wisdom. And Jesus is the one, the Christ, Jesus Christ humbled himself to serve us. This is the attitude that we need to have to be united, isn't it? It's not about me uh, uh, trying to uh, uh, change all my views to agree with everybody else or trying to get everybody else to agree with my views. It's about saying, how can I serve my brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ? How can we be God's temple to be a testimony to the world? A testimony of justice, a testimony of righteousness, right? A testimony of peace. We need to be leading people to Jesus Christ. And as I've thought through this, through this text and worked through, um, well, how would I take all these writings of Paul, these ideas of Paul, these teachings, and wrap them up into a simple, clear, direct message that I can process, something that would, would maybe come alongside me when my pride uh, wells up, when I'm on social media and somebody posts something that just upsets me and it's like, oh, I want to unfollow them. <laughs> you know, or I, I, I get angry and my pride is welling up. What do I need? And it dawned on me, I think I need the Apostle Paul saying, Dave, shut up and study Jesus. Shut up and study the cross. Let me pray. Father in heaven, we come before you in great thankfulness that we have, you have trusted us, entrusted us with a divine message about Jesus the Christ and his death on the cross to reveal your righteousness and your grace, your mercy, your peace, your justice. Lord, humble us that we would want to serve our brothers and sisters in Christ and be united by that faith and by that message that we can be a temple 
drawing other people to Jesus Christ. Lord, address our pride and help us be humble before our brothers and sisters and before you. We ask, Lord, that you would just remind us of Jesus Christ and him crucified. We ask this in his name. Amen.